reading tells us that Christ accomplishes some incredible things through the church, and that this was all a part of God's plan and an unfolding of God's wisdom. I want to talk about that for a few moments this morning. Stay in the book of Ephesians. Our study is going to be coming primarily from the book of Ephesians as I want to talk about Christ and the church. Very thankful for everyone's presence this morning. A beautiful Lord's Day, regardless of what the weather is outside, we're worshiping God, and that makes this a beautiful day. I do look and notice some families that are missing today. Having just got back into town myself, I'm not aware of, of a lot of news that's going on, so we've got some. I hope that they're traveling. I hope it's not sickness that's keeping entire families away from us. That happens sometimes. But we have visitors with us as well today to help fill in some of those gaps. We're always thankful to have visitors that come our way. Hope that you'll find things done here in a way that is glorifying unto God and that will lift you up in the most holy faith. And as always, if you have any questions about anything that you hear or anything that you observe while you're with us, maybe something's done a little bit different, uh, maybe you hear something you've never heard before and would like to talk about that, would you let us know? We'd be grateful to have the opportunity to help you to better understand the will of God. As I've said, I, I came back from holding a gospel meeting, have a report of that written in the bulletin for you to look at if you would like to, maybe not during the sermon, uh, but, but I, I, I like to, to bring back reports of things that are going on in other places with other local congregations, uh, letting you know that, that the gospel continues to be preached, that there are people just like you in different parts of this country uh, battling the same battles that we're battling here, uh, enduring some of the same struggles that we endure, but enjoying some of the same victories along the way that we enjoy here. And we look forward to that eternal day where there is no separation, but we are all gathered together before God in heaven. One of the many privileges and blessings I had this past week was to get to know a young gospel preacher by the name of Colton McDaniel. He's been laboring with the church, the Stone Canyon Church in Owasso, uh, for about four years now, uh, doing an exceptional job there. Uh, he is the son of a faithful gospel preacher, and his brother also preaches. So, He's got that going for him, and he's using it very well. Uh, he's one of these rare combinations of the zeal and enthusiasm of youth, but he's already got a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge, and he puts that to use. So I look for some good things to continue to happen with that church there in Owasso. But it's always good to be back home with you and to be standing behind this pulpit, worshiping God and studying His Word together. What would happen if we separated Christ from His church? When you talk to some people around about us, they really don't think anything of that at all. As a matter of fact, there was one plea that I used to hear a lot. Don't hear it as often today, but used to hear it a lot. Give me Christ, not the church. That is, they, they claim to be Christians. They want to be saved. They want the spirituality. They, they want to go to heaven but they have absolutely no desire whatsoever to be a part of a church. They want spirituality. They don't want man-made religion. In the minds of many people, I guess, Christ and the church are two completely separate things. Jesus is the divine Son of God, while the church is a man-made organization that's full of man-made rules, it's full of faults, and of course, it's full of hypocrites. And so they don't want anything to do with the church. And this separation between the two, I remember hearing something when I was with Paige and Isaac when they were a little bit younger, and we encountered someone in, in Beaver Creek, of all places, and he spent a few moments trying to convince us that Peter started the church and Paul started Christianity. He wasn't able to convince me. I'm still not convinced. I'm still trying to figure out where he got that idea. But to a lot of people, it's two separate things. 
You can be saved without going to church, without being a part of the church. Is it possible to have Christ without the church? No, it's not. The two go together, and they go together in a very unique and a very important and a very special way. And Paul makes that clear in the book of Ephesians. What I want to do, I want to go through and I want to look at four different ways that the Holy Spirit has Paul in the book of Ephesians to show how Christ and the church are united. They are together, and Christ serves the church in an essential way. First, the book of Ephesians teaches that Christ is the head of the church, just like we all have a head with our bodies, our physical bodies. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at verses 22 and 23. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church. All right, let's pause right there. In order to know who the He is and who the His is, we need to look at this verse in its context. And doing so allows us to see that the He is God the Father, and the His is Jesus Christ. So we could read verse 22, and God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. You see, the church is the body of Christ, and Jesus is the head. And I want you to notice that it's spoken of in the singular sense. There aren't many different heads. That is, that, that Jesus is one head of the church, and He's up in heaven, but He also has someone else serving as the head of the church here on earth. And that's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't matter if that's talking about an old man sitting in a chair somewhere in Italy, or if it's talking about a conference of delegates sent from local churches to a, to a city in, in some place here in the United States. There's only one head, and that head is Jesus Christ. But likewise, there's only one body. There's not many different churches like what we hear in denominationalism, and you just join the church of your choice. You pick the one that suits you best. You go and you try them out. You pick the one you like best, and you join that church. And thank God for the churches. No, we read of only one body, one church. There are some observations that we can make with this head and body relationship. Number one, the head directs the body and guides the body. That is, our physical bodies, for the most part, move and respond because of directions that are given by our brains in our head. And so the head directs the body. But what is it that directs the church? It's Christ. It's Christ that directs the church. Now, when someone says the church follows man-made rules, well, if it's a church that was started by man, that's true. But the church of our Lord Jesus Christ does not follow man-made rules. It follows the head. It follows Jesus Christ in in following the words that He has given in the gospel, in the New Testament. So the head directs the body, Christ directs the church. The body makes the head known. And and to make this point, turn with me to, to John chapter 13. We'll come back to Ephesians. Keep a marker there perhaps, that would be helpful to you. But in John chapter 13, I want to look at a couple of passages in the Gospel of John. And I want to, as best I can, to to make this point that the body makes the head known. You know, our heads don't come detached and float around. If our head gets somewhere, it's because our body has taken it there. And and when we each walk into this assembly, and we know that we're present, we can see the head, we can see body, but it's the body that brought the head there. Um, While... We need to be careful and not overextend that illustration and say that Jesus is dependent on us. 
There is a way that we, as the body of Christ, make the head known when we love each other the way that we should. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if we, as the body of Christ, are acting the way we should, then it lets the world know that we are truly followers of Christ. But turn to 17, John chapter 17, in the high priestly prayer, as it's called sometimes, John 17, verses 20 and 21, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. People know Christ is real when they see the church following him. The, the, the accusation, the church is full of hypocrites, I guess could be true if a church was full of people that wasn't acting like Christ told them to. But when the church is doing what Christ tells it to do, then the world knows that Christ is real. And also the head is affected by the body. Look in Acts chapter 9. That is, the things that happen to our body, the injuries that our body has, all those signals are sent to the head. The head knows about those things. And Jesus knows about the things that happen to his body, the church. In Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, Then he, this is Saul of Tarsus, fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So as he was making havoc of the church and persecuting the church, Jesus was feeling every bit of that. I make these points to, to come back to the main point. You can't separate the head from the body. You can't separate Christ from the church. What happens to the body when you remove the head? The body dies. But what happens to the head? It dies too. Look at what people who are wanting to separate Christ from the church are actually wanting to do to Christ. You can't separate Christ from the church. He is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. But going back to Ephesians and looking now in chapter 2, I find it interesting that the Apostle Paul goes from the top all the way to the bottom. Jesus not only is the head of the church, He's also the foundation upon which the church is built. Look in chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So the, the Apostle Paul here uses a figure that the people in Ephesus would have been very familiar with, and that is a temple, a physical building that is built by putting blocks on top of each other. The Jews had their temple in Jerusalem and would have been familiar with that, but the people in Ephesus, they knew what a temple was. They had the temple of the goddess Diana in that city. So they understood the concept of a temple, and Paul uses that in saying that, that the church is that temple of God. And, and each block is put in place when each soul becomes a Christian. Every time someone becomes a Christian, and I was glad to hear that that happened here this past week when I was gone. Every time there's a new Christian, a brand new block gets put in that temple. A brand new stone gets placed on others in that temple, and it continues to grow. Continues to grow even today. But what's the foundation of that? The foundation of that is Christ. The, the teachings of Christ, 
presented in the first century by the apostles and by the prophets. But Paul says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Now, in ancient architecture, the cornerstone was the most important part of the foundation and of the building. Being in the corner, it was a weight-bearing stone, and so it supported and sustained the structure. But also, it was specially cut in order to serve as the alignment of the entire structure. Brother Colley Caldwell, in his commentary on the book of Ephesians, has this to say about the chief cornerstone. The architect fixed his standard for all other measurements of the building on this stone. There is not one single line or angle of the building which was not determined by and adjusted to the perfect symmetry of that stone. That's exactly what Jesus does for His church. Everything that is done in and by the church is done according to the standard of His authority. You take away Christ from the church and you remove the support and you remove the standard for the church, and it is going to crumble. It is going to fall. Denominationalism is going to downplay the importance of the chief cornerstone because Jesus is not the chief cornerstone of their churches. For the Catholic church, they would say it's Peter. For the Lutheran church, it's Martin Luther. For the Methodist, it's John Wesley. You go on down the list. Every church of men that has a human founder, there's their cornerstone. But for the Lord's church, Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is that chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 says that there's no other foundation upon which the church can be built than Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. So He's the head, He's the top, He's the foundation, He's the bottom. He is everything to the church. Continuing in Ephesians, when we go to chapter 5, Paul says that Jesus is the husband of the bride. I want to read these verses. Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. A lot of times when we come to these verses, we will use them to teach about the husband and wife relationship, and I believe that's a scriptural use of these verses. But kept in the overall context of the book of Ephesians, Paul's making a point about Christ and the church. And let's see that as we're reading down through these verses. Verses 22 through 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her, that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The church is the bride of Christ. What happens when you separate a husband from his bride? What do we call that? We call that a divorce. Those who want Christ, but not the church, would just assume Christ do what? Put away his bride. Put away his wife. What God has joined together, let not man separate. And God has joined Christ and His church together. Those who would say that the church isn't important would be like trying to convince me that my wife isn't important. Well, Jesus, I want you 
And I want to be a follower of you. I want to be saved by you. But I don't want anything to do with your wife over there. How's that going to go over? It's not going to go over very well. Or, it doesn't really matter who your wife is. Or well, those who claim that they're all different kinds of churches, Jesus has all different kinds of brides. And that doesn't fit. That doesn't work. No, if, if Jesus is important to you, so is His bride. So is the church. Jesus, we're told in our reading, that Jesus loves the church so much that He gave Himself for her. I thought Jesus died for people. What do you think the church is? The church is people, saved people. He gave Himself for her that He might present her to Himself, a glorious church, not having any defect, but that she should be holy and without blemish. If you want Christ, but you don't want the church, then, then you're saying that what Jesus died for isn't important. Again, that's not going to go over very well if you're wanting the Lord to save you, if you're wanting that relationship with Jesus. Who are we to say that the church isn't important? She was important enough for Jesus to die for her. What God calls holy, we are not to call common. Jesus died to cleanse her and to make her holy. So Jesus is the husband of that bride. We can't separate Christ from His church. And then within this reading, our fourth point, is that Jesus is the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5 and at verse 23, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Those who would say the church is not important because the church does not save. Well, you're missing the point. No, the church does not save. The church is the saved. The church is that body of saved people. The moment that we are saved, we are added to the church. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I'll show you that. Acts chapter 2, the very last verse in that chapter. How can one claim to be saved while refusing to be identified with the body of saved people? Again, we're coming back to this, this desire on the part of some people. I want Christ, but I don't want a church. I want to be saved, but I don't want to be a member of, of the church. How could you claim to be saved if you refuse to be identified with saved people? If you refuse to be a part of saved people? There is no joining the church of your choice. The Bible teaches that the moment that we are saved, we are automatically added to the church by the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You see, the same act that saves us automatically adds us to the church. So I find it interesting that someone could claim to be saved. Oh, I'm saved, but I'm not, I'm not a part of any church. I'm not a member of any church but then you weren't saved. Because the Bible says the moment that you are saved, you're added by the Lord to His church. It's impossible to be saved by Jesus and not be a part of His church. That's impossible. You take away Christ from the church, and the church is nothing but a group of lost people. That's not what the Scriptures teach about Christ and about His church. Those who are asking for Christ without the church are looking for something that Jesus simply does not offer. Jesus does not offer salvation without His church, without His body, without His bride. We can't take Christ away from His church any more than we can take the head off of the body rip the foundation out from underneath the building, take the wife away from her husband, or the Savior away from those who are saved. We must have Christ and the church together. I ask very easily, very simply this morning, are you saved? Are you a Christian? If not, you need to be. You need to become one. You need to be saved. 
You do so by repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 teaches that we're baptized into Christ. And that, that very act that, of baptism that saves us, puts us into Christ, makes us a part of His body, makes us a part of His church. And that's what we're asking this morning. Is that something that you would like to do? Would you like to do that today? Maybe you've done that in the past, but you've become unfaithful. Maybe you've sinned in such a way you need to correct that publicly. We're not here to accuse you. We're here to rejoice with you and comfort you when you make things right with God. And we'd be glad to help you and assist you in that. Maybe you need our prayers for comfort and strength. Whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?